Yeah, we're out here, spring, spring day, and um, green leaves abound. Um, but there's been talk after the uh, news, constant news of the crisis, uh, economic crisis, the financial crisis, but there's now talk that green shoots are out there to be spotted and to be seen. So I wanted to ask Peter, the General Secretary of the Socialist Party, what he thought about the chances of spotting any green shoots. Well, unfortunately, there are very few green shoots. This is another false dawn as far as the pundits, the economists for this system are concerned. And as a matter of fact, the budget itself revealed the gravity of this crisis, a crisis of capitalism, both in Britain and from a world point of view, of state debts of something like £180 billion, 14% of gross domestic product. That gap or that debt can only be solved, and it was spelt out by Darling, in savage attacks on the living standards, particularly on public expenditure in health, social services, education and so on. And moreover, it's not a, a short-term crisis. They spelt out that this crisis could last for a period of years, maybe a decade or more. That's the future that has been offered up to working class people, to the young, to the victims of this system who will pay for this crisis because the measures taken against the rich are minimal. They barely trim the fingernails of big business and those who earn over £150,000 a year. It will be the poor, the working class, ordinary working class people who will suffer as a result of the attacks that have been made and the attacks that are coming. And three weeks ago um, there was massive protests in London against um, the G20, uh, a meeting though which you know, was set to deal with the world financial crisis. Um, don't you think any of the measures that were taken at those meetings, the stimulus packages and so on, are going to you know, do anything to ease the suffering? Days after the G20, we wrote that this summit was largely irrelevant as far as the crisis of world capitalism was concerned, and that has been the case as a matter of fact. There's been a number of stimulus packages. Practically every capitalist government in the advanced capitalist world have introduced and tried to inject money into the system. In Britain it's taken the form of quantitative easing, which is really electronic production of banknotes, hoping that will lubricate the system of world capitalism. But the problem at the moment, arising from the credit crunch, is the enormous debts the banks have, no matter how much you put in, they're reluctant to land. On the other hand, there's a lack of demand. But when the teachers asked for a 10% increase in wages, and if they got it, that would surely stimulate demand, the, the roof falls in, in on them by the press, the media, and so on. Of course, if you get a wage increase, other things being equal, it means less profits for the bosses, and this system is based upon profits. But that's their problem. If they can't solve the problems and give a decent wage, to the mass of the population on all the other conditions that working people have, then we can't afford their system. That's why we're a socialist, why we stand for a democratic socialist plan of production. We don't want a one-party totalitarian regime or anything like that, like Stalinism, but a democratic socialist plan that could use the talents of people which lie idle, which are criminally there in the unemployment statistics in Britain and worldwide at the present time. Well, that's something else I wanted to ask you about, actually, because uh, obviously Darling has really focused on, you know, trying to save young people from being chucked on the scrap heap and so on, announcing that this budget is one that's going to really help young people avoid unemployment. What would you have to say about the measures that have been taken in that, in that direction? Well, again, it's a palliative. It's a panic, short-term measure to try and cover up the problem. The, one of the biggest components of the rise of unemployment is amongst the 15 to 25 year olds. That's going to grow. If it goes to 3 million, it's likely to. If it goes to 3.6 million, then huge layers of young people will be unemployed. They want to cover up the problem in the same way as they covered up the unemployment in the 1980s by shoveling people onto the, onto the disabled roles, will shovel them into education don't give the resources, but on the contrary, cut education, because that's what they're proposing. The massively increasing top-up fees, so the, the, the avenues for ordinary young people to escape from these problems won't be there. It's a palliative, it's an attempt to cover it up, but it's producing a time bomb of unemployed young people who will not accept this situation. They will revolt against this government's measures and the next government if it comes to that, 
and will demand answers to the problems. I think the Socialist Party, and particularly our young members and comrades, have got answers on this. In the March for Jobs, which has been organised in the campaign to save this generation from a return back to the 1930s. I do want to ask you about what you would do now, what the Socialist Party would do now, but first of all, you know, people looking at the European elections and so on, they might be thinking, well, you know, New Labour's response is a rubbish response to the crisis, but what about the other parties? Do they... Well, all the other parties, to one degree or another, are capitalist parties. They have no solution. They're trying to to solve the problems within the confines of capitalism. It's a bit like uh, Alexander the Great trying to un un untie the Gordian knot. He couldn't do it. He had to take a, a, his axe, his sword, to cut the Gordian knot. That's the dilemma facing the working class and the labour movement in Britain and worldwide. But what we would do is we would, first of all, nationalise the banks under democratic control, popular control, involving the producers in the banking industry, but other producers and the consumers, involving those affected like small business people and so on, and drawing up a democratic plan of organising a nationalised banking sector. That's one. We give a minimum wage, a living wage, not just to the low paid, but to all sections of society, including young people, including the criminally underpaid and underfunded health service, the same with old age pensioners and so on. And in the European elections, the only alternative, real alternative in this, is the platform organised by the Rail and Maritime Union, with Bob Crow as the leader, in which the Socialist Party is collaborating to put forward an alternative no to the EU and yes to democracy that is defending workers, like for instance the Lindsay workers and others who have been affected by the anti-working class legislation of the EU. That's the only alternative. And within this campaign, the Socialist Party will be putting forward our own socialist aims and objectives and solutions to the problems of uh, the working people face in Britain and throughout Europe. Okay, and another question I had really was then, I read uh, John Lloyd in the Financial Times claiming that the left is incapable really of, you know, taking advantage of this crisis of capitalism, and um, you know, that they're kind of trailing behind, not able to, to speak to people about it basically. What, what would you say about that? Well, I think that that is false. Mm. He's got a certain grain of truth in his arguments, in the sense that the left, from a broad point of view, is perhaps weaker in this crisis than any other previous period. Why? Because the leaders of the Labour Party betrayed their class, transformed the Labour Party into a capitalist party. There's no difference between them, the Liberal Democrats and the Tories in fundamentals. The same thing happened in Europe and indeed throughout the world. The trade union leaders adapted to capitalism in, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall when a furious campaign was conducted against socialism. So in that sense, a mass alternative is missing. That's why we advocate the creation of new mass socialist and workers' parties in the same way as has been created in Greece with Syriza mm -hmm. and also with the, the Left Party in Germany and with the anti-capitalist party MPA in France of Oliver Bessensonon, mm -hmm. which has got a substantial position in the elections, that's the way that the working class of Britain needs to go. So we need a broad mass alternative. But a party is for a, for a reason. Mm -hmm. That party must stand for something against this system and put forward alternatives to capitalism, as I've tried to explain, on jobs, on housing, on education, and put forward the idea, renovate and rehabilitate the ideas of socialism that appear to have been wiped out in a mass form in the last 20 years. And that's coming, by the way. No matter what Lloyd says, he's, he's trying to uh, congratulate himself that capitalism doesn't face a challenge. It doesn't face a challenge from Brown. It doesn't chase, face a challenge from Darling. It doesn't face a challenge from right-wing trade union leaders, but it faces a challenge from working class people and particularly the new generation who will not accept what this system is promising them, which is a diet of cuts, of mass unemployment, deprivation and poverty as far as the eye can see into the future.